green areas are higher. And this maybe more tellingly shows you inclinations. The gray areas have more than 60% inclination. Legally, from the building code of the city of Caracas, you're not allowed to build in any zone which has more than 45%. Uh, inclinations. I'm not talking about degrees. That would uh, that would be a little really neck breaking. I'm talking about percent, but that's still a lot. Just uh, test it out when you go back to your to your desk. And here you see the the, the infrastructure that cuts into this uh, into this area. Each of those squares that you see here is 500 by 500 meters. So those white lines are the roads that cut into it. So you could almost say. This is a, a macro parcel of land which is folded, almost like the, the bands of your brain, uh, which is folded around some access roads, which are actually dead-end roads. The road just goes in. If you want to go out again, you, you drive back out again. So these are, this is really, let's say it simply, it's the minimum infrastructure maybe to, to uh, bring uh, uh, materials for construction of houses in, etc. This is not an infrastructure to reach particular parcels of land or a house. And this here is the density. We, uh, with a good reason, we uh, present here the, the buildings in a dark green color and the, the open spaces or the distances between them in a light green color uh, because this has something to do with a, a plan about uh, uh, urban agriculture that we will come a little bit later to. So this is about a project now that we like to present. Well, let me let me first say something um, about our practice. Let's up to this point we've described certain dynamics of the informal city in Caracas and elsewhere in Latin America, but the question remains: What does the informal city mean for architects? What does it mean for those who work there in the global south? Um, we'll offer some examples. As, as we said in a minute. But um, one, one could differentiate between two types of planning. You can focus your plans on what you hope to accomplish, best case scenario. Or you can focus your plans on what you hope to avoid, worst case scenario. From everything we've seen, architecture in the informal city is following the second model. There is no ideal conditions. The point is avoiding catastrophe. Architecture in the informal city takes place in the context of urgency. You see this? in the self-built houses that dominate the barriers. The roofs in the barriers are designed to allow for another house being erected on top or another floor. In fact, one challenge you would face is that most people build their own houses. As we mentioned earlier, four out of five houses are being constructed right now in the city has a pattern based on appropriation of the land and development of their house over that stretch of 25 years by the family that lives there. In the informal city, the architect has the potential to be an agent provocateur. Um, this is something to engage in what we could call in Romer in Guadalajara when we met, uh, called performative architecture. But we have a little twist maybe on it. And let me explain but what we mean by this. A performative action is usually defined as a type of utterance that through its very enunciation accomplishes or generates a particular effect. The classic example in speech is, I accept your offer. By saying this, you're both making a declaration and performing the action, which is the subject of the declaration. We believe an architecture can be performative. That is, we see ourselves as agents or initiators of statements in built form or in abstract that can set in motion a series of social practices. This is a, the performative role of the architect can help delineate the contours of a community and turn collectivity into, into or reshape collectivity and also engage in a constant shaping and reshaping of the borders of the city by negotiating inclusions and legitimizing exclusions. So uh, maybe next we'd like to show you a little bit what we do and uh, how we do it in our practice. Um, after Columbia University in New York, we were faced with the urban reality of Caracas. Through so first-hand experience, we discovered overwhelmingly that not enough is being done to address an increasingly, increasingly exaggerated urban condition. The city we experienced had very little in common with the myths of the progressive modern Latin American city propagated by architects such as Villanueva 
in Caracas, Lima, in Brazil in the 1950s, etc. Uh, Saskia Sassen talks about the global cities like New York, Tokyo, London, etc., where many architects have chosen to work in a star system. We chose to work in the global informal city. If any of you read MP Dunleavy's Dan article uh, on last weekend's uh, Herald Tribune, The Thrill is the Chase, you might recognize the sentiment that progress is not always buying um, you uh, the place where you want to go. As architects, we have the choice to challenge uh, materialistic treadmills of progress, of progress and of objective architecture and look maybe, and that's our suggestion, for a practice of architecture based on other ideals, like real structural changes uh, for the global south. Our practice is committed firstly to placing the social reality of a site at the forefront of political discussion. Our work does not merely contemplate the city. Rather, we initiate scenarios of change in the city through direct interventions that correspond to a, to a series of scales and parameters. So now here in this case, we'd like to show you um, uh, on a concrete example, one of the things uh, we are doing at the moment. This picture here shows you a basketball field in one of those barrios in Caracas uh, in its original condition. The situation was not unlikely, like Alicia's house. People move in a certain area. They're living on a, on a one-floor little house, etc., etc. As time passes and generations grow, uh, the entire area around there became practically a continuous mega building where they still had this only one uh, basketball field. We came up with the idea to uh, multiply those areas on four levels put the basketball field on the, on the top, having a running track, uh, having a, a gymnasium, volleyball field, uh, 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 artes how do you call it? Martial arts. Martial arts area, which is very popular, and after all it's better somebody hits each other in the, in the face than shooting a gun at, at each other. Uh, and this is how the thing is built up. We have patented it in the meantime. Uh, in Venezuela, uh, as a as a um, diseño industri industrial, which is an industrial design object, uh, which allows us to give the plans to build this structure for free to communities who want it, uh, and we go afterwards there and we build it. So that actually put us in another position, let's say, in the production of architecture. We are actually giving the archi architectural services for free. It's only a question of adopting the project but we're also getting involved in the, in the real construction and that, in that way we have learned a lot from the reality also in the barrios because what is quite interesting is uh, traditionally um, you would say uh, for any project that you're doing you secure the land title. You wouldn't invest your money in a piece of land which is not yours logically. That knows even the city mayor who only puts the World Bank funds in the area which is municipal land. So you secure the land title then you make a plan, then you construct, and then you occupy whatever you have constructed. In the informal city, uh, this is almost inverse. People occupy any given piece of land, they construct whatever as fast as possible, then they start planning and they start thinking what they can do about it, and at the very end, they might try to secure the land title. Just wanted to say that this is one of those friction zones between, let's say, uh, middle class housing and let's say, and the barrio in the in, in an embedded barrio in the middle of a prime real estate area of Caracas. In fact, uh, it's the served and the sir uh, and the service. So, in a sense, there is an interrelationship between the two, but there's no common space in which they meet. So that playing field that was good for six against six in in little soccer game um, suddenly became a community center. And it's uh, been so successful uh, for the community with more than 17,000 visitors. So... Uh, Mo monthly. So that, that, that those numbers sound pretty amazing. I'm sure any museum in Rotterdam would be happy to have 17,000 visitors per month. But this is explained by itself because of these densities. That doesn't mean that 17,000 different people go in. 
that starts at 7 o'clock in the morning with 150 people who participate in therapia, which is a sort of an animated dance and gymnastic class, and that goes on until 10 o'clock in the night. So, and 